Welcome to The Lex Factor, a lawfully good podcast where we'll brief you on the business of law so you can build a better practice and capture more billable hours. Hello and welcome back to the latest episode of The Lex Factor. I am your special guest host, Randy Shorefighty, sitting in for Lauren Hoffman and Brad Pauble. I'm fourth in line batting cleanup, so here I am. Before we uh, get started and introduce our guests, just want to make sure to mention everyone, um, you can get this episode or any other episodes of The Lex Factor. Go to our YouTube channel and you can like and subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you get your podcast episodes. So today, I want to welcome and introduce from The Bar Plan, and they'll talk more about what The Bar Plan is all about. We have Whitney Dunn, who is Senior Risk Manager and Charles Coffey, who is Director of Sales and Marketing at The Bar Plan. Whitney and Charles, hello and welcome. Hi, thank you for having us today, Randy. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. No problem. If you want to just take a moment or two, uh, each of you, just to you know, intro yourselves and talk about what you do at The Bar Plan, We'll start with Whitney, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Well, I am in risk management at the Bar Plan. Um, the Bar Plan is a legal non-practice insurance company. We write in five states, and I'll let Charlie, as our director of sales and marketing, talk a little bit more about what the Bar Plan is. But within the Bar Plan, I am in the risk management department, and our goal is to make sure that attorneys are practicing ethically and they are analyzing appropriately the various levels of risk inside of a law practice. And we can provide guidance to um, how to mitigate some of those risks, how to avoid them entirely with the right types of steps inside of law practice management. And so I'm really excited to be here today because I think that what um, what I do and what the bar plan does is going to definitely be something that is relevant to your listeners. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And now we turn the microphone over to Charles. Oh, thank you. So I have actually uh, started at the bar plan back in 2012 in their claims department. Like Whitney, I'm also an attorney by training and trade. And so I spent about eight years handling uh, malpractice claims against lawyers uh, in the claims department at the bar plan, uh, excuse me, new role as director of sales and marketing. The bar plan was really born and formed out of uh, a crisis, and that was in the mid '80s. All of the legal malpractice insurance companies that were sponsored by some of the large insurers that you probably can think of, uh, they began pulling out of the market, and this was happening around the country, actually. Um, they were finding that it was not profitable to write lawyers' malpractice policies, mm -hmm. and so they stopped doing so. The Missouri Bar, actually, uh, some of the attorneys on their executive committee got together and decided then that uh, they would, the bar itself would form a, uh, an insurance company to, to share the risk amongst the, all the attorneys in Missouri. So we are now independent of the Missouri Bar, but um, you know, we still take uh, bar service and membership and everything very seriously. And if I heard you correctly, both of you are attorneys by trade, correct? Yes. And so um, it's always nice to get a perspective from uh, individuals who are attorneys by trade and then they go into some form of, you know, in, in some line of business um, related to the legal industry. And now this is just a personal question on my part. How much of it, I mean, I can understand there's an advantage. What type of advantages or advantage is there? So whenever you're talking, I mean, is that an easier way to get your foot in the door or to get, you know, maybe it's, a, you know, some managing partner's attention. The fact that you guys yourselves are, you know, attorneys by trade and that opens the door a little more and they're a little more comfortable talking to you guys about, you know, uh, insurance and risk management topics. Is that, is that fair to say? Charlie, do you want to take this and then I'll chime in? I think this is more. Yeah, than absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the things at the bar plan that is important to us is that um, we really understand our insured's needs. So all of the attorneys um, that are at the bar plan, which there are many uh, throughout the company, have all practiced uh, in private practice. And so we do understand what our insured's are dealing with on a daily basis and and we like to think we can sort of understand a little bit better what they need. So, yeah, I think it's definitely very helpful because that helps us mold our messages and our offerings to 
um, to really what attorneys are, are looking for out there in the market. Wonderful. Yeah, and I think that when someone calls to ask a question about running a law office and about practicing law and what the ethics rules require, the fact that we are attorneys, I do regularly um, talk to attorneys where I provide some guidance and they'll say something like, well, are you an attorney? Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm able to say, yes, I am. And, you know, and I've been in this situation before and I understand how you are, um, you know, how you feel. And I understand your approach from a legal perspective. That is, it lends authority to, um, to what we are guiding them to do beyond the fact that we are the experts because we deal with these things every day. We also have personal understanding and knowledge about what it's like to be in that situation. And we find that attorneys really appreciate that. Kind of take us into this, uh, into this topic. You know, we're talking about how lawyer impairment and well-being concerns affect firms financially. From the LPL perspective, you know, high number of claims and potential premium in- increases, exhausted deductibles, and et cetera. How does risk management fit in with lawyer well-being? Honestly, for a long time, lawyer well-being was something that wasn't really properly considered in the profession. It's only been within the last um, about five years or so that lawyers and um, and bar associations and, um, and law firms have started to really look at this. Originally, this movement began as a um, study that was sponsored by the Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs and then co-sponsored by the Hazelden Betty Ford Center. And the survey results were bleak. I don't think that that is hyperbolic to say it is. It is something that lawyers were struggling with, Mm -hmm. and the survey demonstrated that. And we, as an insurance company, have seen that historically. You You can look at the claim history of various firms, and it absolutely is something that is detrimental, not only emotionally and physically and mentally, but financially right. to attorneys to let these problems fester and not respond to them um, and to to not give it the due that it is owed. And so we view this, you know, view caring about lawyer well-being as an essential part of law practice management. And it is truly caring about yourself first as a lawyer mm-hmm. and making sure that you are healthy to practice is the first step of appropriately managing the risk of being in the practice. Right. And Charlie has so much experience with this from the claims perspective. Also, when he was <laughs> our uh, one of our claims counsel, he saw this a lot. And, you know, he can probably speak a little bit more to that from the claims perspective. Right. It was always something that personally was a little baffling to me that it wasn't something that was addressed more. Um, my wife is a physician and I've been, she uh, sort of on that, the first, uh, or excuse me, the last generation of physicians that, still was kind of under the old guard where she would leave home at seven o'clock in the morning and not come back for 36 hours kind of thing. Um, and right after she got out of medical school, they changed that. And even at that time, I was always saying, you know, how come, you know, how come there's not such a movement for lawyers, you know, right. um, myself and, and friends, you know, had certain requirements. Um, you know, some of the firms would make sure that you slept with the, your cell phone by your bedside, you know, answer a call within 10 minutes, that sort of thing. Um, so these things have been happening in the legal industry a long time. And, um, when I got into claims, you know, it was always mystifying why people weren't paying attention to it purely from a monetary standpoint, because, you know, it really certainly hits people in the pocketbook. Um, you know, these, uh, the nature of the practice of law is such that one problem really can cause everything to spiral out of control. Right. And, um, you know, a, a, it's also a, a, a profession that often lends itself to isolation. You know, attorneys, even, uh, you know, whether they're in a, a large practice or a small one, you know, they really feel ownership of their cases. And so uh, a lot of times, you know, other than maybe um, another attorney working on pieces of it, you know, nobody really knows what's going on as well as that main attorney who has that case. So it's really hard to both discover, uh, you know, these issues and also to remedy them. 
because uh, there's just not anybody else out there who has that knowledge. The term that comes to my mind is like uh, working in a silo, almost. Absolutely. And I think that comes from a couple of places. You know, there's certainly the idea of protecting what you've built. The practice of law is, uh, to put it sort of harshly, eat what you kill. Right. You know, you're, you're out there trying to get clients and, and you know, you're, you're doing your best and you don't want to sort of uh, open that up too much for fear of somebody taking them. But that can really lend itself to a lot of problems, especially among, you know, with wellness issues. Yeah. And so, you know, let's say it's a medium sized law firm, whatever that is, let's say anywhere between, you know, 10 and 25 lawyers, if that's considered medium or small, what might be an average number of claims that could be, I want to say filed or submitted in just a calendar year? To, to kind of put it into a, a framework, um, there was a study done and it's been years, um, and it hasn't been updated, but it was that uh, the study found that an average lawyer amongst their career would have at least two claims. So over um, probably maybe 30, 40 years. Maybe? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And those are specific claims. Those weren't things like uh, disciplinary complaints with bar associations, things right. like that. These right. are specifically claims. Um, so if we kind of look at it in that framework, and, and again, I would argue that's a little bit outdated. And I think we've become more litigious, <laughs> so that that number is probably higher. But right. um, though, and those, but that that uh, study now, of course, uh, this was a while ago, so it didn't take into account wellness issues. Right. But um, you know, it was really looking more at things like missed deadlines, uh, failure to file, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, attorneys are, are only human and so they do make mistakes and the practice of law is complicated. So a firm that size, um, it certainly would not be unheard of just on a normal basis to have, um, you know, one or two claims reported per year okay. um, or, or possible claims reported right. uh, per year. So, you know, certainly possible, you know, when we add wellness issues into the mix, especially as the firms kind of grow in size, it's hard to uh, really detect these issues um, because, you know, everybody is siloed. There's not that uh, sharing of cases as there may be in a little bit of a smaller firm. So right. those issues really could cause things to balloon. You know, we've had an attorney who has reported between 20 and 30 claims in one year, you know, due to wellness issues. And right. so, you know, Th those things certainly do happen and, and it's really hard to predict a certain number, but I guess I, I'd end by saying, you know, one of the things that we really find is that when a claim comes in, we don't necessarily know at that time if it's the result of a wellness issue. Right. Um, that's something that we discover, you know, a as we investigate the claim, right. because that kind of comes up, you know, it's, it may appear to be a missed deadline, but it was a missed deadline because that attorney was going through maybe substance abuse or, you know, some sort of mental health crisis. That is not apparent, you know, at the outset. Right. And to demonstrate how this issue going unchecked can really cause claim issues to spiral out of control, there was a firm um, that we ensure that over the course of it was longer than a decade. They may have reported about 14 claims. Right. It was a small firm, not even a mid-sized firm. And, you know, about 14 claims in over a decade for, a, a, you know, a handful of attorneys is about in line with what Charlie had said. And then in one year, I believe it was over 30 because wow. of an issue relating to lawyer well-being. And they didn't, they didn't see it coming and they hadn't done anything to, to safeguard against something like that happening, and, and right. it did. So what are some of the symptoms of a, of a firm at high risk to be surprised by, you know, any well-being issues? So one of the things has already really been mentioned. It's a law firm that either by its structure or just doesn't pay attention and it naturally happens that attorneys get siloed, mm -hmm. that there's not any type of collaborative work happening and everyone is just responsible for getting their own thing done. Right. And I understand, you know, again, being an attorney, I totally understand why that is something that happens. I understand why it's attractive. You have a million things on your plate. Why do you need to stop and take time to keep other people up to speed on what you're working on? Right. It just, it seems like a waste, but it really isn't a waste when you see 
the way that this can balloon. This is a long, long, long ago anecdote, way pre me being at the bar plan, I think even pre Charlie being at the bar plan. But there was a firm that had three attorneys in it. And they were, in addition to being um, partners, all they they all were very close friends and, and socialized with each other outside of the firm as well. Right. And one of those attorneys was coming to work every morning and he would go into his office and close his door and he would be in there all day. And then he would leave at the end of the day. You know, they would see him at social events on the weekends. His partners had no idea he was suffering from a well-being issue because they were just siloed. And they said, well, you do your work, I'll do ours and whatever. And he was suffering from severe depression. And as a result, bad things happened. So one of the ways that you know, being siloed, one of the ways that that can be prevented is through appropriate calendar control and periodic firm-wide meetings just to go through what's coming up on the calendar. Right. And in today's day and age, whether that's in person or even virtual, even virtual, it's still it's still a touch point. And he's coming into work, just like you said, he comes in, goes in his office. You know, he may come out, he may come out of his office periodically, interact but no one really knows what's really going on inside, you know, internally for him. Sort of to, to piggyback on what Whitney was saying, the scope of this problem is, I think, bigger than a lot of people realize. And the inability to detect it is big, too. Um, I, I practiced down in South Florida for a while, and uh, the managing partner of one of the firms I was at um, had started his own firm uh, after having a a pretty tragic situation unfold. Uh, he was a partner in a smaller firm, but with a very prominent attorney. And one of his classmates was that prominent attorney's son. So they all went into business together when the prominent attorney was sort of in the, the twilight of his career. Right. And that attorney was suffering some from some vips of some very, uh, very severe mental health issues and actually ended up committing suicide at the office sitting at his desk. Oh, wow. And obviously that caused such a huge ripple effect, but, you know, both his child and his law partner had absolutely no idea that he was going through all these things. So, right. you know, it's a situation of people are embarrassed about it sometimes, you know, it's, it's not something that's talked about a lot. And like Whitney said, until recently, it really wasn't something that was really recognized. So it's a huge problem and it causes, you know, just absolutely huge ripple effects. And so, you know, we've talked about some of the symptoms or maybe some of the more prominent symptoms. So what can law firms do to respond to these types of risks? Well, you know, like I said, it's really important that there is appropriate calendar and docket control and um, and regular meetings to to discuss and, and look at what's coming up on the um, on the calendar in the coming weeks. Every law firm should have a central calendar that every single person who works in the firm as an attorney, as a member of the support staff, in any capacity works in the firm, they should all be able to see everyone's dates. And mm -hmm. a lot of attorneys balk at that because of the siloed, you know, siloing issues that we've talked about. But that's one way to keep up with this. If you can see a calendar and you have periodic meetings reviewing the calendar and you see that there's a small, you know, maybe it's just a trial setting, right. but it's been, even having the hearing to set the trial has been continued six times because someone is clearly struggling and cannot get themselves to make that appearance for whatever reason. That right there is the type of thing that is a red flag. It should be responded to and it can only be brought to light by not by avoiding those silos. Right. Another thing we recommend for law firms, you know, another potential risk factor in line with being siloed and being um, individual, being individuals even in a larger law practice is utilizing support staff and an at-risk law firm would have support staff that are tied to and loyal to their individual attorney even more than the law firm. And that, that's something that can absolutely be common. And it's an amazing thing that a legal assistant and an attorney can have a great relationship and can work so closely together. But a legal assistant who is loyal to his or her attorney for whom that legal assistant works right. is a lot more likely to step up and try to cover for them, mm -hmm. try, to, try to hide that from some of the other members of the firm. So there needs to be training of... Um, 
legal support staff and assistance too to make sure it's a kind of if you see something say something right. if people are calling and making complaints about an attorney for example well this guy won't ever return my calls that should be by that legal assistant brought to the you know a managing partner's attention or someone's attention so that it can be responded to because it's probably one you know related to a well-being issue Whitney, and I think you said it best, and it sums up this this episode. If you see something, say something. The the loyalty that they may have, or the level of the loyalty that they have with the attorney or the attorneys that they work with, yeah, they might be able to spot something before anyone else in the office would be able to spot it, just because of of what Charlie, what you said earlier about working in silos. If one attorney is able to, I don't want to say come to grips, but if they recognize it and verbalize it. That could be a cue for any other, you know, whether attorney or legal staff within a firm to maybe step forward and or say something, whether it's themselves or somebody else. And, you know, one thing um, that I personally uh, we did in in one of the firms that I worked for, um, it was a tax firm and we had different groups uh, that handled sort of different levels or different uh, types of taxation. And we actually would get together for a billing meeting. Uh, the head of each department. And, um, you know, that can be tedious, but it also was a great way to understand and also to look at the people on each team, Mm -hmm. you know, and something like that can reveal issues because if, you know, somebody has uh, billings drop off, um, of course, which nobody wants to see from a financial (laughs) standpoint, but, uh, you know, that can really, um, you know, that can indicate some issues as well. Um, and a lot of times you can you can really tell what an attorney is working on through their billing, right. or at least you should be able to. Right. Um, and that could be a good way to to kind of uh, root out that as well. Um, you know, th- there's a lot of different ways to do it, and you have to find out what works best for your firm, time wise and personality wise. But it's really important to, like Whitney said, to somehow sit down face to face or virtually. And, and go through these things. Right. All great points. I can't remember. I think this is the first, if it's not the first, it's the second time that we've talked about uh, either well-being or mental health or some kind of self-help topic on the Lex Factor. And so whenever whenever I reached out to Whitney on this and she offered this up, it was, it was a great topic. And so, and we could probably go on for, you know, the rest of the day or even a couple of days on this topic, but uh, this is a great introduction to lawyer well-being as risk management, you know, talking about the symptoms and what, and, you know, getting tips from you, Whitney and Charlie on what law firms can do to respond to these risks. This is a great episode. I think it's fair to say that we will have Whitney and Charlie back in a future episode talking on a totally different topic, but yet still related to risk management. And so I just want to, again, thank Whitney Dunn, Senior Risk Manager, and Charles Coffey, Director of Sales and Marketing from the Bar Plan, in today's episode talking about lawyer well-being as risk management. Whitney and Charles, thank you so much for being a guest, and I know we're going to have you on in the future. Thank you so much for having us. It's my first podcast, so this has been a fun way to break me in, and I'm excited. Yes, I'm, I can't wait to come back and do more. <laughs> yeah, I don't, we don't have a first-timers club. I think we may have to do something about that, Justin. Mail out a certificate or something. Charles, thank you as well for being on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This, you know, this is something that uh, we definitely uh, care very deeply about, so we appreciate you uh, allowing us to discuss it with you today. Whitney Dunn and Charles Coffey from The Bar Plan. And to close out this episode of the Lex Factor, again, you can go on you on our on the Lexicon Services YouTube channel. You can like and subscribe to any current or past episodes of the Lex Factor, or you can go anywhere you get your podcasts to like, subscribe, and download. I'm Randy Shorefighty, closing out this episode of the Lex Factor. Thanks for tuning in to the Lex Factor. Lexicon takes care of business so you can take care of law. Learn how to build a better practice at lexiconservices.com.